Welcome to the series. Welcome back. So hello, my name is Carol White Evans and I'm the Chemicals and the Environment Agent here at the Extension Office in Sarasota County. I'm joined today by my co-worker Sarah Bostic, our Sustainable Ag Agent. Also our colleague Mindy, who does an amazing job of monitoring the chat box and is important to this all running smoothly. So our communications guru is Kevin O'Haran. Um, he does an amazing job for us in getting these videos loaded um, and onto our website. And if you haven't seen it yet, we also have that weekly, weekly blog that's associated with the series. So please go ahead and go to our website and check that out as well. So thank you all for joining us today, the Edible Garden Series. Um, we offer every Monday from noon to about 1230, 1 o'clock. Um, this week's topic is the silver leaf white fly. Um, again, I'll spend about yeah, probably 20 minutes discussing this topic, um, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, like always, go ahead and enter your question in the chat box, and Mindy will be uh, monitoring that chat box throughout the presentation. And then at the end, um, you can ask any, you know, we'll open it up for a question and answer. And it doesn't have to be associated with, with white fly today. It can be any, any of your gardening questions. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So um, this webinar series came from um, hearing over and over again from county residents that they're frustrated at trying to garden in Florida. Um, me included. Um, these are customers that are either new to gardening, um, have been trying to garden, or um, have moved from another state and are trying to garden. Gardening in Florida, as well as other locations, um, can be quite difficult, but the rewards are amazing. So this series grew out of that need for more information around gardening and being extension. Um, we're excited to be able to offer that and to support our community. Um, we also want to give a shout out to our um, gardeners outside of Florida. We're so happy to see people from all over the country, um, all over Florida, all over the country, and even some international gardeners that join us weekly for this webinar. Um, you guys are a big uh, component of this and we're very grateful of that. So. Today we're going to be talking about the silver leaf whitefly. So the silver leaf whitefly, it's a tiny insect that causes a lot of problems in the garden and in the landscape. So um, white flies are small soft bodied insects. They're in the order Hermoptera and they're related to aphids and mealybug, leaf hoppers and scale. Um, there are over 75 species of, flor of white fly in Florida, but Bamesia tabacchii or tabacchi, this, which is the silver leaf white fly. Um, it's also called the sweet potato white fly. It's one of the most economically important um, species of white fly. It's a major pest of vegetable crops, um, specifically tomatoes and peppers, but it's also a major pest of many other plants as well. So that's both vegetable crops and ornamentals, um, including weeds. So the adult whitefly has a, a yellowish body um, with white wings and they're a little bit less than one millimeter long. So they're, they're, they're pretty tiny. Um, the adult holds their wings in a tent-like fashion over their back, which is one way that you can tell the difference between the silver leaf whitefly and another important species, which is the greenhouse whitefly. Um, the greenhouse whitefly actually holds their, their wings flat over their backs. Um, whitefly are found year round in Florida um, with the highest activity is in spring, um, but it runs from mid-April through November. Um, in perfect conditions, they can have up to 21 generations of, of uh, whitefly per year in, in southwest Florida, so where it's warm um, most of the year. Um, and just a side note, um, there are two types, uh, two biotypes of silver leaf whitefly. There's the B biotype, which was established in the US in about 1986. And then there's the Q biotype type that was recently detected in retail nurseries in Florida in uh, 2005. One of the biggest challenges uh, commercial growers face with whitefly is insect resistance in both the, bu the B and the Q biotypes. Um, that making it more complicated, um, the Q biotype has shown even greater tolerance to insecticides than the B biotype. Um, so insecticides should never be a go-to uh, for whitefly control, although um, you know, using uh, pesticides should never be a first stop in pest control anyway. Um, but so you can imagine that there's been a lot of research um, around this particular insect. So um, these little insects are extremely common on a wide variety of plants. Um, we'll get into the specifics in, a, in, a, in the next few uh, slides. The adult, as well as 
all stages of the insect are mainly found on the underside of leaves. They typically prefer to stay hidden under the leaf than to fly off the plant. But when they do fly, um, it's typically only for very short distance, distances, excuse me. An easy way to tell if you have white flight is to just tap on the branch and see if you get this little white cloud that forms and then disappears back onto the, onto the leaf or back onto the plant. You definitely have white flight when you see that cloud. Female whitefly are attracted to plants by uh, visual stimuli, so like the plant color, texture. Um, she will taste the plant to see if it's suitable for egg laying. So she will deposit eggs like in a random pattern on the underside of the leaves as she is feeding. So she feeds and deposits eggs at the same time. Eggs are mainly laid on the upper canopy. This way the immatures have this nutrient rich leaves uh, to feed on and it can support them until they reach that adult stage and they, they pupate, so they pupate out and um, become adults. So the female can lay up to um, 300 eggs during a two week lifespan. So um, she can be busy. Um, Egg stands, uh, eggs stand on their end. So as you can see here, um, they stand on their end and they start out as a yellow color, but they turn this darker amber as they get closer to hatching. The eggs hatch in about seven days when temperatures are between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the first immature stage, which is, is here, the first immature stage or the first instar is called the crawler stage. It is the only immature stage that has legs. It, you know, once it hatches out, it's going to move a short distance until it finds a place to feed and then it will settle. When it finds that perfect feeding spot, um, it inserts its stylet and starts feeding on the plant juices. So the stylet's like a needle-like mouth part. Um, the legs then atrophy and so the immatures are then stationary and can no longer move them that from that particular feeding location. There are a total of four instar stages um, with the second and the third instar stage are the primary feeding stages. So this second and this third instar stage here. Um, the fourth instar stage is actually the pupil stage and it's a non-feeding stage. It's also called the red eye stage. I know this is not a very good shot of it, but it's also called the red eye stage as the eye spots are very prominent um, at this point. When they're in this second and this third instar stage, the one thing about these is they're very flat and they're they're almost translucent, so they're very difficult to see when they're on on the the leaf. Once you hit this fourth instar stage, it starts to um, build up, and you you can see those. So I'm going to talk about this fourth instar stage again. So the insect stays stays in the stage between one and two weeks. Um, well, then it it then emerges through a T opening in the dorsal site. So on its back. So this is its opening here. You can see this here. Um, this is important to note because if there are parasitic wasps. Um, around, they attack white fly nymphs, and they emerge through a round opening. So this is what, a, if you have a parasitic wasp around, this is what that opening looks like. We're going to talk about those later as well. It's also important to note that the later instars and the pupa are found on the lower leaves of the plant, right? So we talked about when they are, the eggs are laid, they're on the upper leaf, but as that plant's maturing, right, those, those, those leaves are moving down. So that's going to be really important when it comes to monitoring for that insect. Once the adult emerges from the pupal case, it can mate within hours of emergence and it starts laying eggs within two to three days after emerging from that case. So complete development from the egg to the, to the adult takes about two and a half weeks to seven weeks, depending on the temperature. So in a perfect environment, right, it's, it's warm, uh, long day length, um, it's gonna be that two and a half weeks, but in the winter, it's gonna be more towards that seven week stage. So for, okay, so where is it found, right? Actually, the easiest question to be about white flight is where isn't it found? Um, Bemisia is widely uh, polyphagous, which means that it's able to feed on many different kinds of plants. They have been identified to feed on over 900 host plants and from over 74 different families and they vector, vector over 100 plant disease viruses. Um, we're only going to discuss uh, two 
of those most damaging um, diseases will, that, that are vectored by the white fly. The list of host plants include most broadly vegetable crops and many ornamentals such as like poinsettia and hibiscus. Um, Silverleaf whitefly are particularly problematic in solanaceous crops, um, which are plants in the night, uh, nightshade family, but they do not infest all of the solanaceous crops. They are a major pest of tomatoes and peppers, but they also um, infest squash, cucumber, beans, eggplant, watermelon, and cabbage as well as things like potato, uh, peanuts, soybeans, and cotton. So there's a huge uh, uh, variety of, of garden plants that you're gonna find them on. Whiteflies are piercing sucking insects. So they have that needle-like mouth part for feeding. And this is the problem. Most of your piercing sucking insects are the problem with, with uh, they, were, they vector viruses. Um, they're damaged by plant, they damage the plant by feeding on the plant phloem. Um, as they feed, they inject enzymes and then they remove the sap, um, which reduces the vigor of the plant, um, or in some case, in severe infestations, they can actually kill that host plant. Um, um, both the adult and the nymph feed on plant juices, but only the nymphs produce honeydew, um, which we talked about honeydew before, like if you go back to some of our other, um, our, our other sessions, um, honeydew is that black sooty mold, or I'm sorry, sooty mold is, is that black mold that grows on honeydew. So um, when you get these, these nymphs feeding, you get a buildup of that sooty mold. Sooty mold indirectly affects the plant by decreasing the plant's ability to photosynthesize. So that's gonna reduce that plant vigor and also fruit production in the, you know, in the long term. So direct damage caused by white fly feeding includes things like plant distortion, discoloration, uh, and like silvering of the leaves like you see, you see here. Um, you also get things like stem blanching, uh, chlorotic spots, and leaf yellowing and shedding. Leaf yellowing is a really common issue with white fly feeding. Um, leaves turn yellow, they appear dry, or then they can also just fall off the plant. Indirect damage from white fly feeding is through uh, virus transmission. So that's what we're going to be talking about next. So, well, in a few slides. So ornamental plants. So the ornamental plants that are particularly susceptible to silver leaf white fly infestation and damages are things like poinsettia, hibiscus, chrysanthemum, um, daisy, lantana, and salvia. Um, many of these are in our landscape. So movement of adults between host plants of the garden and ornamental landscape uh, plants is pretty common and can be predictable. So if you have susceptible ornamentals in your landscape, it's important to monitor those year round um, to make sure you don't have a presence of silver leaf white fly. So there are numerous root weeds, excuse me, <coughs> weeds that um, are host plants for white fly. So general rule of thumb, like always, is start clean and stay clean. Um, since there is a wide range from other families that can be infected by this virus, but most don't develop um, obvious disease symptoms. So a lot of times weeds aren't going to show symptom, but they're going to be, um, um, they're going to be a host of that virus. Um, these hosts serve as a bridge for the virus in the absence of tomato crops, um, and perennial reeds help to allow that virus become permanently established in the area. So keeping the virus, they keep the virus active and available so that they can transmit it, right? So that if you end up having a white fly issue, they transmit it from that weed onto your garden plants. So keeping the garden and the surrounding area free of weeds throughout the year um, will help to minimize that potential of uh, both white fly infestation and uh, the potential of vectoring that, that, that virus or viruses. So developmental disorders and virus transmission. So white fly feeding can cause irregular uh, ripening of tomatoes either directly from feeding or indirectly through that uh, transmission of uh, Gemini viruses. So specifically tomato yellow leaf curl virus. Um, we'll talk about the two that are most problematic in growing tomatoes, and that's irregular fruit ripening, which is a, that's a physiological disorder caused by just nymph feeding, not by the adults, and also tomato yellow leaf curl, um, which is to, 
transmitted only by Bemisia species of whitefly, primarily the silver leaf whitefly. The adult stage is the only stage that transmits the virus. So again, irregular fruit ripening is transmitted um, by or is caused by the nymph, but uh, tomato, tomato yellow leaf curl is only transmitted by the adult. So talk, we'll start with irregular ripening. So irregular ripening is developmental um, and caused by nymph nymph feeding. Um, nymph feeding on leaves causes the tomato uh, irregular ripening when the fruit, the fruit doesn't actually um, color uniformly and it causes this streaking. Sorry, I have two monitors there. It causes this streaking on the fruit. Um, even if the external of that fruit appears to be normal, the internal tissue may become white and hard and unripe and just basically unedible. This can happen at extremely low numbers of immatures. In production crop, it's about a half a nymph per leaf, so extremely low numbers. Um, there are no foliar symptoms associated with, with this, um, this issue, so without with uh, irregular fruit ripening. Um, and it is only, again, associated with the nymphs, not with the adults. Um, the one thing to remember throughout all of this, so is that um, Many of the white fly vector viruses and other insects also vector viruses, as well as fungal diseases, um, which they all can present very similar looking um, symptoms. So it's important to look at all of the symptoms and not just one symptom in order to diagnose what the, what the actual issue is. So I know that's one heck of a statement because if you say, you know, 70 of those, those transmittable viruses, uh, you know, cause yellowing, um, but so does a lot of other issues like, you know, overwatering, um, you know, uh, you know, under fertilization. So you have to look at the holistic approach and looking in at the, uh, the plant as a whole. Get my cursor to work here. Okay, so tomato yellow leaf curl virus. It's always a mouthful. So this is a Gemini virus transmitted directly by the feeding of the adult only. Um, and only Bemisia, so the silver leaf white fly, have the capacity to spread this disease. It is one of the most um, important and devastating diseases of tomatoes um, in, in Florida. It can cause huge crop losses in commercial uh, crops. It's uh, The plants infected at an early stage um, will not bear fruit because what they end up doing is they, um, they drop their flowers and so, you know, they can't produce fruit, but then also growth of the plant itself will stop. Plants can be infected at any stage of growth. Um, the virus is only spread by an infected whitefly. It cannot be transmitted by seeds or spread mechanically, right? So through cutting um, of the plant, through touching it, through harvesting, none of that's going to spread it. It cannot survive in the soil. It can't survive on tomato steaks. Can't survive on wire or string. So really, it's only that adult whitefly that's going to transmit that disease between between those plants. It can spread by movement of infected plants. So you know you're going to move that infected plant to a new area. It's going to start being fed on by a whitefly. Um, it also can be uh, by wind currents because if you have an infected whitefly, um, it can then vector that to wherever that white fly gets blown. So, you know, it, this is a, a disease that is really important to um, get, a, get a hold of early on and, and, you know, getting rid of that plant that is, uh, that is infected. And, it, you know, because it can't spread in the soil, it's not going to move between plants through any way besides that white fly. Um, it can take about three weeks for a plant to develop symptoms but the infection can be transmitted during that time by whitefly feeding on a diseased plant. Whitefly actually, they pick up that, that virus. It, it, it's not instantaneous. They have to feed on that plant for about five to 10 minutes in order to get enough of that virus in them. And then about 10 hours later, that virus has built up in that whitefly enough that then it can be vectored into another plant. So it takes about 10 hours after feeding on, a, on an infected plant for whitefly to be able to have that capacity to, to, to vector that virus. And then when it feeds on a, another plant, it's going to take it about five to 10 minutes to, um, to vector enough virus to then infect that plant. So, um, you know, it, 
that's why it's it's really important, you know, to maintain um, control of your white fly populations and to minimize those populations. Um, early signs of tomato yellow leaf curl um, is evident in the leaves. Um, leaves of infected plants, they're small, they're really, really uh, like strongly uh, crumpled, right? So they're, they look really coarse. Um, they curl upward and they turn yellow at the edges and, and between the veins. Um, again, if they're infected, if plants are infected at a young stage, they're not going to bear fruit um, and they're going to be severely stunted. And other symptoms that are typical of this disease are things like uh, leaf molting, uh, modeling, sorry, not molting, leaf modeling and flower drop. Transplants um, are, it's rare for transplants to be um, infected. If you're going to get commercial transplants, like if you're going to go to Home Depot and get transplants, they're usually treated with a neonicotinoid um, while they're being, um, after, after, you know, they've, they've emerged so that they, you know, aren't going to be, um, be susceptible to those white fly at that time. So as the infection progresses, though, plants can get um, these advantageous root growths along the stem. Um, they can also show signs of stunting in these larger than normal uh, stems. So they, the, the stem becomes thick and those inner nodes become shortened. That, and that's what gives them that stunted look. And again, they can be if, uh, get infected at any stage of, of the plant growth. Um, plants infected at older stages um, may continue to mature that um, the fruit that's already on the vine, but it's going to take longer to ripen and the plant's going to continue to be an, 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 a source of infection um, or a source of host for infection for that white fly. Um, older plants have that a higher viral, viral load. So um, Roguing disease plants is recommended so that they cannot become a source of inoculum for healthy plants. Um, so how do you actually control whitefly? So employing management strategies early on and utilizing integrated pest management strategies is the key to a successful gardening se se uh, season. So this is not only just how to control your whitefly, it's really how to control you know, any insect in your garden is using IPM. Um, session three, uh, which was offered back in October, was dedicated to um, IPM. Um, so you're welcome and encouraged to go back and look at that YouTube video and or you know read the blogs associated with it, um, so you can get ready for this this season's garden. But the basics to IPM are applying cultural controls, monitoring scouting, um, monitoring and scouting, using biological controls, and then if needed, um, when all those others have have um, failed um, is then turning to uh, chemical controls, but mainly biorational products. So tomato yellow leaf curl, it's always such a mouthful, is noticed more easily by contrasting um, among infected plants and non-infected tomato plants in the garden or between garden plots. So as you can see here, this is, this is an infected plant and this is an uninfected plant, right? And then if you look at here, um, these are susceptible uh, strains and this is a tolerant strain of, of tomato. So it's pretty obvious when you have a, a yellow leaf curl. Um, diagnosing, so visual diagnosis is more accurate when there are two or more symptoms, right? Because I said you had to look at more than one thing um, to decide what it is that's causing that issue. Diagnosing based on one symptom, um, can lead to error. And then, you know, if you have the wrong kind of treatment, if, you know, if you're roguing a plant because you think it has yellow leaf curl and it ends up not being that, then you've just lost a source of, of a, a, a production source, right? So follow good cultural practices when planting the garden. So before planting, um, plant varieties of vegetables, especially tomatoes, that are tolerant to yellow leaf curl. And if you're using transplants, be sure to use virus and white fly free transplants. Look at those, those, those plants, you know, and check the underside of those leaves to make sure they don't have any, any white fly eggs or, or nymphs on them. Um, rotation planting of susceptible crops is, is helpful and that's going to help you minimize that potential for carryover between the silver leaf uh, carryover of the white fly itself between seasons, right? Remember, because I hear year round. Um, 
planting of tomatoes should be separated in time and space from planting of other known whitefly uh, hosts, such as like your cabbage, your collards, soybeans, and weeds. Um, make sure to pull those weeds. I mean, I'm, I'm going to keep saying this over and over, over again, pull those weeds. Um, try to avoid planting near older fields that have crop residue, especially the ones that have crop residue in them, or planting near an area that you know that was infested with whitefly previously or is, is still infested. Then during season, um, again, keep up with that weed management in and around the garden. Um, learn to identify those early symptoms of leaf curl and rogue infected um, plants from the field. A good way to do this is you, you put them in a plastic bag. Um, so you want to cover them with a plastic bag, tie it at the base, and then cut it off. Because if you have whitefly feeding on that plant at that time, you know that that whitefly now is going to have, can be able to vector that that virus. So if you just go ahead and, and cover that plant and then cut it and then throw it in the trash, it's the best thing to do. Make sure you are always actively monitoring for whitefly. Um, you should always be visually inspecting your plants at least two times a week for both the adults and the immatures. And remember, you're going to be wanting to look on the underside of that leaf. Control your ants in the garden. Um, ants protect whitefly um, from their natural enemies. They also protect a few of the others, like aphids, from, from uh, natural enemies. Um, and then rogue your disease plants. So. After a season, you want to remove and destroy your, your crop residue and any volunteers that are in the area, right? Because those are going to be a host for those whitefly. Um, do not use crop residue or diseased plants for composting. Don't throw those plants. If you know they have disease, don't throw them in your compost. Always want to err on the side of, of caution. Again, right, place them in that bag and toss it in the trash. You know, that's you, you don't want to carry that over to your to your next growing season. So I've already discussed, um, can, but can't be said enough, weed management, pull those weeds. Um, they are host plants for many different pest insects, um, including thrips and aphids. Um, so don't let the weeds, you know, ruin your gardening season. So address those weeds both inside and outside the garden. It's really important. Okay, so another great thing is reflective mulches. So reflective mulches are extremely helpful and they're passive controls for repelling the adult whitefly as well as many other insect pests um, since they like to rest on the un underside of the leaves. So these reflective mulches can be like shiny uh, metallic coated construction paper or re reflective plastic mulch uh, and you're going to want to place them around the base of that plant um, so that what it does it reflects that light back up to that underside of, of the leaf. Um, especially helpful in small plants, right? So um, you're, you're going to want to put this mulch down as soon as you plant. Um, these things are available online. Um, they're in, available in some garden stores. Um, you can even take uh, like clear plastic mulch and spray it with a silver, a silver paint. So anything that gives you that reflective ability is going to be beneficial. You can even take old pie plant, you know, tins and, you know, cut a hole in them so that they, you can put them around the base and it can reflect that up under to the underside of those leaves. Um, this is also going to help you with um, controlling weeds, right? So once you, any, any mulch is going to help uh, reduce that, those amount of weeds that are around that area. Um, remember though, to remove these mulches because they're shiny. Remove them when the temperatures get, get high because you're not, what's going to do, it's going to reflect that heat right up to the underside and you're going to get some uh, leaf burn. So remove those when the temperatures get, get high. They lose their effective, so mulches lose their effectiveness when the, the, the canopy cover covers more than 60% of the surface, right? So um, once that, that plant starts to mature and becomes pretty big, you're not going to get that same benefit from that mulch. So just know that it's, it's really, it's important to do it early, but it's also important to do it early because if you get an infected plant in an early stages, basically it's not going to produce any fruit. So yellow sticky cards. Um, I love these things uh, for the most part. Um, they're great for monitoring insects, um, especially whitefly. They won't eliminate uh, the populations, but they will reduce the populations. 
and they're a great part of an, an IPM uh, management plan. Um, since whiteflies stay close to the plant, you're going to want to place those, those sticky cards close to the plant. So you can either hang them above the plant or you can actually even clip them on like, like here we have one here. You can actually click clip them directly to the plant. Um, you're going to replace the, the cards when they get really, you know, heavily uh, covered by insects. But remember, because these are passive monitoring traps, um, they're going to collect anything that comes in contact with them. So you may end up finding some beneficial insects that are stuck to the cards as well. Um, so biological controls. So biological controls nature's uh, free pest control service, right? And you should do whatever you can to conserve these beneficial insects because um, that ultimately means that you're gonna be spraying less chemical in your garden. The primary form of biological control for whitefly are parasitic wasps. So parasitic wasps are, the, are one of the most reliant and effective form of biocontrol. They're these tiny little tiny wasps um, and they sometimes get confused with gnats. So people sometimes wanna like, get rid of them, right, when these are actually really good to have around. Um, as you can see in the picture, you know, here's, here's a parasitized, uh, you know, fourth instar and that, that uh, wasp is inside of it. And here's one that has just hatched out. So um, they parasitize the nymph in the early um, instar stage so that they, they also have their uh, enough time to complete their life cycle before that that nymph would be able to hatch out. So make sure you're monitoring for biocontrol um, that are in the garden, because it's important to know what you have working you know, in your favor. So if you do need to use chemicals, um, be sure to use only bioirrational pesticides in order to protect these natural enemies. Other forms of natural enemies um, for against whitefly are things like the green lacewing, um, predatory lady beetles, uh, tachnid fly larvae. So that's what this picture is. So these are three uh, pupating, right? So that's the point where they're getting ready to, 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 to hatch out. But So these are three tachinid uh, fly larvae. Um, you have big eyed bugs, predatory mites, um, intimopathic, intima, I always get this wrong, intimopathogenic fungi. So, if, uh, you know, fungi that actually will grow on, on the, the nymph. So th this is all um, naturally occurring. You can also, you can also buy product. Um, I will talk about that in just a second, but you can spray this in your garden so that, um, you know, it's there to help you against those nymphs. So um, all of these are quite common in, in your garden and your landscape, but again, they do need your, your help in, um, in uh, minimizing your, your chemical applications so that uh, you're not adversely affecting your biocontrols. So this is my last slide. So um, this leads us to the final step in IPM. So that's your chemical control. So uh, reliance on conventional chemicals has led to high insect resistance in whitefly in both the landscape and, cro and crop. So using bio, uh, biorational chemicals as part of the IPM program is a good option for controlling your problematic whiteflies. It's best to control pests, insects, when they're at, at low population numbers, right? So if you still have a whitefly problem after you've tried those other things, using mulch, right, um, monitoring, you know, using your yellow sticky cards, among some other things, then you're going to want to turn to biorationals uh, for help. Um, products that are effective um, are things like insecticidal soap, neem oil, um, horticultural oils and microbial insecticides um, that contain that, that um, intimopathic fungi. Azeractin can also be used. Um, azeractin is that component of, of neem, but it is considered a conventional chemical. So, um, you know, I would use uh, soaps and oils before I use that azeractin. There are reduced risk pesticides that you can use as well, um, things like in, um, insect growth reg regulators, but again, they're conventional chemicals, so I would use those as a very, very last resort. Um, and then um, horticulture oils, the good thing about horticulture oils is that you can actually use those as, as a repellent as well as a control application. So the whitefly don't like to, to um, to rest on on that that oil, so you can actually use that kind of like when you're using insect repellents on on your skin. So um, uh, hoard oils work really well in, in two different ways. 
So with that, here's a resource list. And I must say, these are some really good, um, you know, uh, sites of information. So those will be on, on this PDF that we give you. And with that, it's the end of our, our Monday edible gardening number 15. So I appreciate you guys joining and sticking with me.